me first, from deepest of my heart and my family, tell you thank you, thank you, thank you. You were tremendous and you still are with the kind words and the prayers. I realize that this is a difficult time and if you've ever been through a loss of a family members, it's hard to describe as well as create an antidote that automatically pops back and uh, but it's day by day, sometimes minute by minute. And often it feels like it's hour by hour. But I want to thank you. Thank you for the love that you have shown uh, to this community uh, who has surround your arms around our families. I wanted to take the time and tell you thank you for all the love and the caring that you have shown. Uh, it is so much appreciated and has been well receive. Before we begin our study together, uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gathering at this time that we have. Lord, we ask that your word go out, not only to that our ears might hear it, that it is put it into our hearts and give us an understanding. We pray, Lord, that your scriptures come on forward. There is a reason why you have at this moment together. And so Lord, I ask you that every word that is spoken, every scripture that is read, give it for an understanding as well as an enhancing in their lives. And Lord, we will give the honor and the glory. We thank you for everything that you have already done. And we are just tremendously grateful for things that you're about to do. And thy son Jesus name, amen, amen. Well, this time together, we will be dealing with lesson 13. Lesson 13. Uh, this is considered our fourth week. And the title for our lesson uh, is Don't Give the Accuser More Power Than the Advocate. Again, don't give the accuser more power than the advocate. Our devotional reading, that is the background to set the stage for our lesson, comes from Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, verse 31. Let me first read the King James Version, and then I'll quickly read uh, the International Version. But Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, verse 31. And we're dealing with uh, not giving the accuser and we'll define the accuser, more power than the advocate, those and that entity that will save us. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up from us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifies? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine our nakedness, our peril, our sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you would just bear with me as I read the international version, the international version of Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter eight, again, starting at verse. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare son, but gave him up for us all, how he will 
not also along with him graciously give us all things who will bring any charge against them who God has chosen? Is it God who justifies? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our devotional is Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 39. Our devotional speaks. It speaks to God's salvation, his plan, his salvational plan, a plan that reaches from the past to the future. In this particular Romans chapter 8, this particular verse is in Scripture, Paul challenges us with roughly seven questions. And within the questions, he also answers with the truth of understanding. These questions, these questions are designed for us as believers to understand the truth about internal salvation, for us to be confident and secure in God's plans for our lives. Question number one, verse 31. He starts off by saying, what then shall we say in response to this? You can either pick it up in verse 30 when he begins to tell you how you are adopted and part of that life, or even in the last bit part of the scripture itself. What then shall we say? It becomes a praise that when you hear all what Jesus has done for you and what God has allowed for Jesus to claim, all you have to do is raise your hands and say hallelujah. What it's saying is that at that point, in that moment, nothing else that you have to worry about. He has set the tone for us. But he goes on and says, question two, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Can you imagine that? If God is on your side, you know, often as a child, you would divide up. And as you stood in a circle, you would try to pick up the people that you felt can do the best, those who could catch the ball after it was kicked, those who could kick the ball and run to the base. You are trying to strategize so that you can pick the best team. Well, here we have someone that is supreme of all. If God is on our side, whom should we be a fear? It doesn't matter. You know, often we say, you know, the devil's done this and the devil has done this. But I want to share with you, only God is omnipresent. If the devil's at my house beat me up, how can he get to your house to beat you up? But the Bible does says he took a third of the uh, heavens with him. So there are demonic spirits that run about, but they cannot prevail against God. And so we want you to grab a hold of that. Paul goes on in verse 32, ask another question. Who he who did not spare his own son, how should he not freely give us all things? You know, often when things are pretty tough in my own life, and when there's things that, uh, you know, as a want versus a need, I remind myself, if God allowed his son to die on a cross just for my sins, then what is a car? What is a house? What is provision? He loved me so much that he allowed his son, didn't have to, he allowed his son. And it wasn't just as if his son came down and climbed on the cross on himself, but they were wrongly convicted him. Not just because he did not help, but he had did miracles, he had help. And they just didn't take him to the cross, but they beat him, they lied upon him. And some say they even spit on him. 
and they whipped him and then they nailed him to the cross. The Bible says he had to bear our sins so we can be claimed unto him. This God that allowed all of that, don't you know he wants you to be saved for your salvation? Don't you realize that he loves you? He who did not spare his own son. In the Old Testament, uh, there was a man by the name of Abraham that was tested. God told him to take his son up to a hill to sacrifice. Can you imagine that? gathering sticks and the items that you would need to sacrifice your own son. The Bible says, where is the sacrifice? When they got to the altar, can you imagine your own son that you had to lay out and you had to give up his life to a God? You don't think in your mind, you're saying, what kind of God is this that would allow me to take my own son's life? But if you read it a little bit further, God says, before you raise that knife and do any harm to him, look over to the right. And he provided a ram in the bush. He didn't allow him to take his own son. But God did not intervene. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. He did not even spare his own son for our sins. We're talking about the advocate. Paul goes on and asks another question. Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? Who is there to speak? Is it the devil who wants to bring up things from our past? Is it the devil that says, well, God, they did this. What about this? Who is this accuser? Is it Satan come to speak what we cannot become instead of speaking of who we are? Yes, Satan can also uh, uh, give explanation to our sinful nature. He can, he can bring out the things that we've done, but thanks be it to God, we have someone on our behalf that will not only present us so that we're in clean before God, but he knows the judge. You're talking about an inside hand. Yes, you can take me to court, Satan, and do all you have, but not only do I know the judge, but the plan the judge has already put to clean up my life. So then who is, has the power to excuse us? God who will justify us and God who will give us the glory based on us just simply believing on him. God can work it out. There is no reason for us to tremble. Paul asked then, who is he that condemns? He talks about Jesus who died on the cross, who has the power to judge, but the same entity, the same Jesus who judged, also gave up his life so that I can become blameless. He gave up his life that I can have glory. He gave up his life that he could forgive every sins that I've ever committed. So those that feel condemned, we are adopted by the faith of God. We are adopted by his power. No need to worry. So then we say, don't worry about the accuser. Don't give him that authority. But how about we celebrate the advocate? Then he goes on and asks a particular question. He set the scene. He asked us questions that challenges our intellect, our emotions. And then he gives us a particular question as he sets us up for the answers. He says, okay, I understand that you're in a life that doesn't seem that it's all things and going, like we say, roses and everything is going well. I understand you in a life that sometimes you feel you're hurt and there's pain. I understand that you have ambitions and dreams and sometimes you cannot, feels like those things are not achievable. So Paul asks an interesting question that forces us all to examine ourselves. And what kind of faith do we have? In verse 35, he goes on and says, who shall separate us from the Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Understand how he put that. Who shall separate us? And then he asks, the love of Christ. When something loves you, when somebody loves you, when you love something, you cherish that. It is very important to you. So then he goes on and says, I understand 
that you're contemplating the question. So let me help you out. He says very humbly, shall tribulation separate you from the love of Christ? Shall distress separate you? How about persecution? Is that gonna separate you? Oh, you say, what well, you too deep. You speaking too you know, religious, but let's make it personal. Shall famine, huh? That is the natural. Shall nakedness, not having all the things in life, all as we say, the bells and whistles. Shall peril or even the sword. What shall separate you from the love of Christ? Paul quotes, quotes seven things, seven things that feels that might challenge a believer. And there might be some of us that, and my heart goes out for you, that might have to deal with all seven things throughout their life. But Paul sets the tone. Who shall separate you? Are these seven things, things gonna separate you? So in our devotion, Paul sets the scenes by asking questions, challenging our intellect, getting us to focus on the advocate. But he, so, he begins to summarize it in verse 38 and 39. And if you pay close attention to verse 38 and 9, he gave you seven things for you to challenge, but he gave you 10 things that I want you to focus on. Verse 38, and I'm back to the international version. Verse 38, Romans chapter 8 says, for I am convinced. So after Paul has challenged your intellect, after Paul has asked you these questions, after Paul has met you right there where you're hurting, he then gives you this statement. For I am convinced that neither death or life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present, what I'm dealing with today, or even what I'm about to become in my future, nor any powers. He says, neither the height or depth, nor anything else in all creation. He cleans it up, he says, not anything else that you can even imagine, anything in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our devotion sets a tone for us to mentally picture our relationship and for us to understand who really holds the power in our lives. Our lesson, again, our title was Don't Give the Accuser. Don't give the accuser more power than the advocate. An accuser is someone who claims uh, that, that, that they know someone or, or this, they have uh, the evidence of someone who's committed offense. And the key is they claim that someone has committed an offense. But the advocate is someone who supports the person that is accused. If we are trembling at the accusations, if we are trembling in life anxiety, if we're trembling with the heavy burdens of the heart, then we're unable to see the power that can bring us out. So let's not give more power to that. Let me look into our books. Our book says fear, doubt, and lies are the tools of Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 tells us that he is an accuser, okay? Satan is an accuser to the believers, to the brethren. He is the father. That means he has the best lies. So you ain't got to worry about believing him. He is the father of lies, and he will do anything anything to deceive, to destroy, or even accuse the believer to cover up God's love. The believer, okay, must learn how to fight these fears. 
the believers must learn how to fight these fears. Often uh, when you have a phobia, they get you to slowly work up to that phobia. And the key is to make sure that what you are afraid of is not bigger than the actual that we actually see. We often joke and hear how an elephant is scared of a mouse. But how many things in our own lives that are smaller than necessary? But we have put on the wrong set of glasses, the wrong set of spiritual vision, and we have made it bigger than the God himself and the advocate. So the believer has to learn how to fight these fears and these anxieties. And you do this with the power of God's word. No weapon formed against me. His word gives powerful promise to the believer. And this will cause Satan to run. In other words, when Satan realized that you, you state that no weapon formed against me and you heard me give the example before that they can be given on layoff slips and how you respond to that in your spiritual. Oh, I've been there where I didn't know if I prayed more than I cried or cried more than I prayed, but in my heart and in my mind, I knew that God still was in control. And pretty soon, it might seem like a dark cloud begin to lift. You must believe that you have the power. God has given the believer the and the power to tread and to trample over the enemy in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. And we might sometimes feel helpless when the enemy attacks, but we have the power, we have the power to overcome. I want to share our central verse with you because it referenced the power that we have. Our central verse says, first out of the King James, and our central verse is Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Our central verse reads, Behold, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any means hurt you. In the international version, Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Luke chapter 10, verse 19 says, I give you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. I want you to take a spiritual look at that scripture. We see the word snake. We see the word scorpion. You know, we see the word serpent. Uh, and, and we focus on that particular item or that particular entity, uh, that, that particular insect or that particular, but we focus on them, but in the spiritual realm, because they represent at that time, deadly, uh, these were things that could kill you. These are things that uh, could cause great harm. In the spiritual realm, what we're saying is that we give you power to go against some of the toughest things that Satan will bring your way. Those things that are so devastating, you know, there are certain poisons that when you are bit, that it mobilizes you. You can't hardly move. You, 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 you have, look like your breathing is contracted. Uh, your body goes into shock. He gives you power so that when Satan attacks you, when it seems like you can't get out of bed, when it seems like you can't hardly breathe, when it seems like it becomes more than you can handle and my rationale state is not clear, he gives you power to overcome that. He tells you in the century verse that he gives you power that no harm can come your way. We often speak of Satan has the power and, and, and we say that uh, he, you know, Satan's got me bound, but he persuades us. He gets into our mind to believe his power is greater than God. He plants doubt and confusion that leads us to believe we don't have a chance. 
he tries to convince us that there is no hope. But there is hope. There is a belief. The devil releases this fear factor and the believer becomes intimidated. Fear brings a person the spirit of torment. Did you catch that? Fear brings the spirit of torment. You're looking for peace, but you're hanging with fear. You're looking for calmness. You're looking for hope, but you're hanging with fear. You're looking for God to bring you out. I can't make it another day, God. I need you, but you're hanging with fear. I share the example, and I want you, if you can visualize, if you were in a school gym and you had to go to the locker room, inside the locker room, there are lockers that you put your clothes in. And after you secure your clothes, you close the door, and it's a way of protecting or securing your clothes. Some are fortunate to actually have locks. Now, that lock on the door is designed to be an extra layer to protect our clothing, or our items that are very dear to us. Can you imagine that if you're in the room and they have a set of lockers on one side of the room and then on the other, there's another set of lockers? But on one side of the room, it is Satan who owns those lockers. He has doors that call fear. He has doors that are called anxiety. There are doors that are called depression. But on the other side of the room, God has a set of lockers. God's set of lockers are hope. God's set of lockers are peace. God's set of lockers are uh, uh, preventing you from having to be in a distress. It is the kindness, it's the love. And so in the middle of the room, without you saying a word, whatever pops in your mind opens up the locker. If you stand in that room and you allow fear to overcome, the locker of fear pops open. But you have the power to put fear back into the locker, grab a lock from God and lock it, and then turn to hope. And if you can see yourself having hope, the door opens up. If you can see yourself having peace, the door opens up. If you can see yourself prevailing against whatever the enemy brings your way, then you're able to be victorious out of that situation. Don't allow the devil to persuade you to open up the doors on his side of the room. Don't allow the devil to tell you that these lockers are special and they're designed for you because of every generation in your family, they have opened up a locker. Don't you know greater in you and you can make a change, not only today, but this very moment. Close those lockers. But I want you to believe because it is the plot of the devil to cause the believers to have much mental anguish and deep distress. It is his plot. If I can get you to believe in your mind that you are nothing, if I can get you to believe in your mind that you don't have a chance, if I can get you to believe in your mind that there is no hope, then you will do the rest. All I have to do is plant the seed and keep telling you, you less than the conqueror. All I have to do is plant the seed and let you know that you are not adopted in God's family. All I have to do is plant the seed and say, you're not more than a conqueror. Paul challenged us with the question, who should separate you? Who is there to condemn you? Don't you know God is not only sits on high and he is the judge and your case has already been handled? You just have to believe. You just have to trust God. But the believer has weapons. We must use them to combat the fears. We have truth, we have love, and we can communicate to God. Sometimes you just have to talk to him for yourself. And when you're talking to him and you're serious, 
All you're simply doing is praying to them. It's a conversation. You don't have to be articulate. You don't have to worry about going through any protocol. You just humbly open up your mouth and begin to pray to God and communicate to him. And if you do that, if we let Christ's love, Christ's love that comes over our lives, if we allow this to happen, we can cast out those fears. His love equips every believer to overcome whatever Satan brings your way. God communicates his love to us, us believers, that he is on our side. Don't you know you don't have to worry? He's already have you adopted into his family. So when the enemy comes your way to tell you that you are less than, don't you give the accuser more power. We focus on the advocate, God. And this is the thing that is so great. Jesus, who sacrificed his life for us. If you read the part of scripture when he was nailed to the cross, after he was beaten, after they mocked him, put thorns on his head, on his head, he still uttered the words, God, forgive them. Father, forgive them, because they don't even know what they're doing. How many times when we're at a place in our lives where we thought we knew what we was going, but we didn't have a clue that we were killing ourselves rapidly. Don't you know, if you are troubled, if you think that there is no peace, if you're wondering that, that thought that keeps going in your mind that you know better, that you can make a change, God is there with his arms waiting for you. And this is an opportunity for you to overcome God. So there is nothing Satan there is nothing Satan can say. There is nothing Satan can do. Oh yeah, we feel pain. And yet there is a hurt. And yet we feel we don't have enough. But Paul asks you, who is going to separate you from the love of Christ? If God loved you so much, if God loved you so much that he allowed his son to die on the cross, don't you know he'll make sure you have enough toilet paper? You just got to believe. You just have to believe. And you have to know that nothing shall separate us. We understand that Satan is a troublemaker. And you know that he is trying to get us to doubt God. That is his job. But it is important. It is vital for us to believe on God. And we cannot give Satan more credit or power. You know, often when things come in, into life, and I said it before, it's the perception of how we look at those things. And some might we would say, you know, if if you couldn't afford to get the nicer car or if something's not in uh, in the right perspective of, of, your, of your life, and sometimes there's tangible things that we want, I change my perspective. And sometimes if the car I want is not available, then I says, God, you're just making sure I know how to read the manuals before it gets here. Or God, you're just making sure that everything's in place. I shared uh, a story, but uh, my children, I think they were early teenagers, maybe 12, maybe 14. And I got to get the timing right because the Wii, it was a game console. It was called the Wii, uh, was very popular. And... Uh, my children knew that there was some schoolwork that has to be done and, and, and games are not a priority, but uh, they were excited and they wanted the Wii. But they wasn't exactly sure, could we afford the Wii? Will we be able to obtain the Wii? And so it wasn't intentional of being cruel or trying to play a joke, but the Wii came with games. You know, you can buy it as a set and then you can get some additional games. So when the Wii came, we also wrapped up the games. So just trying to see where their thought process were, just trying to see how their spirit was. The games were underneath the Christmas tree, but the game console, the Wii device itself, was not in the room. And so as the children began to open up the different gifts and they got to the games, they opened up the games that particularly go with the Wii package itself. 
And they said, oh, wow, we have the we. Look, we have the games. And I says, yeah, we have the games. And maybe one day God will bless us to get the council. Without missing a beat, they says, well, it's okay. You know, we at least have the games. We're excited. At least we have the games. And then one day we'll get the council. And I want you to know it was a good understanding that they understood the importance and where we were. It's not for them to poke their lip out and pout and, and not appreciate what they had, but they were appreciating what was there. And so then they were able to go into the other room and get the game counsel. Sometimes in our lives, we are so complaining what we don't have that we don't stop to celebrate and thank God for what we already have given us. We give the devil so much power. I don't have this. I didn't get this. This is not coming on time. And we forget to give God the glory. We forget to give God his due. You know, it was uh, said a couple of times, and if we get together we'll, uh, soon, we're going to hear some of the powerful testimony, how some people uh, check was delayed. But they said right when they got to the end, the check came. And I, as I heard the different testimonies and stories, I chuckled. And I says, do you realize that your testimony was even more powerful than it was if you got the check the first day? Don't you realize that we often talk about the birds are not concerned how they're going to get, they're going to fly, and then they're going to land. And some are fortunate because people put bird feeders in certain neighborhoods. Some are fortunate uh, because some people put out dish fertilizer and the worms come to the top. But they're not so much concerned at that moment after they have gotten what they need. How much for us? How much do we put more faith in those things instead of God? Little secret, if you would worship the person who gives it all, there's nothing you have to worry about the gifts. If you would give your hope and faith and belief to a God that knows all, that sees all. Don't you know when his son came down, he was in tune with his son, that he understood the pain, he understood the disappointment, he understood how we would do those things and yet allow his son to say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Be careful of how we give the adversary. There was a letter uh, that was shared, and it was a story. And, and the story says that in the mail, uh, there was a letter received, and it was false accusations. And so they shared it with some of their friends. Because when the letter came and the false accusation, it really hurt them. And for someone to lie on them was hard for them to understand and to gather. And they couldn't believe, why would somebody do this? Why would somebody lie? Why would somebody send the letter? But one of their friends said to them, one of the friends who really knew them, one of their friends who had spent time and had no doubt about their character, they said to them, now at the letter, there is no signature and the person really couldn't confront you. So you cannot, you cannot let Satan, the accuser, make up this thing about you, these false accusations that get you so confused, so worked up, so out of emotions that you don't even see the facts that's there. In my children's life, emotional things happen to them. And sometimes they get so worked up. And I share with them, don't you allow anything to get you that emotional worked up that you lose control in your character because you are greater than that. We understand that the adversary is coming to kill and destroy, but greater, but greater, but greater, huh? Is he than that when it comes at us. I understand that life is not always as easy as we would like for it to be, but I know a God that sees all. 
Sometimes the believer spends countless hours praising the devil instead of giving praise to God. If the believer sins, he has to realize that we have an advocate, but we have to be very careful not to repeat the same sins over and over and over again. But I want you to know that you have an advocate and you ain't got just any lawyer. You know, often we joke that if you don't have any money, you have to take a, a public defender. Uh, but there's some good public defenders, just like there's some bad private lawyers. But you have a lawyer. You have an advocate that has graduated top in his class. You have an advocate that sees the future. You have an advocate that knows your soul. And so when that advocate goes to present you, when that advocate says that you are part of my family, when that advocate says you have nothing to worry about and you go into court, do you realize who the judge is? The advocate takes you to court to speak on your behalf, but this is how he starts off the case. My father, can you imagine that? A father that loved him so much and here the advocate is his son and his son says, dad, forgive them for all that they have done. Dad, give them another chance. Dad, they love you with their whole heart, mind, and soul. Don't you know that you have an advocate on your behalf and he is powerful enough to rescue the believer from any powers the enemy not brings to us. We understand that the devil deals in darkness. He wants the believer to doubt the power of God. He wants us not to know that God who controls our life is concerned about us. And when a believer is not sure, then he cannot access all the covering blessings that he has. He is not able to focus on the saving grace. He's not able to focus on God's healing power. He's not able to focus that God will deliver them from anything. And when he cannot focus, when you do not allow yourself to stand in the word of God, then how can you help others? How can you be an example? How can you draw all to Christ? But when we focus on what God can do, and when we give more power to God than Satan, then who can separate us? Who can condemn us? Who can prevent us to standing with God? I want you to contemplate in your life, and I want you to believe that there is no weapon formed. There is nothing that can be done. There are things that you have to accept. Often I share uh, with different ones and my kid goes, I know, I know, I get it, I get it. But I share with them and I share with other loved ones, remember, no one can take your dignity. You have to give it to them. No one can take your dignity. So Satan cannot take your power. You have to give it to him. Satan cannot cause you to do these things. You have to allow him to guide and force you to do them. But if you make a stand, if you say, I believe in God, if you say my hand is in his hand and I trust you and God, you can take me and hold me in your bosoms and I will lean onto you, we begin for us taking control. And I want you to take control. If you're at a place now in your life where you believe, but it's gotten tough and some days are more, seems more overwhelming than others. If you're at a place in your life where God has been playing, tickling with your heart, there has been thoughts in your minds where you know there is a better way than the life that you have. If you had a point where grief seems like it's overwhelming and I don't know if I can go on, would you pray with me right now and ask God, would you find yourself, your inner self and focus on your relationship with God? As I pray, 
I want you to focus on as if God was in front of you and you're humbly with hands reached out asking God for help. Our Father, Lord, first of all, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity that we can come to the grace of mercy. Lord, we thank you that you allowed us, that we're able to uplift your name. We're able to come to you, reclaim our souls. Father, before we go any further, I ask you to forgive them of anything that they might have done. If they do not know you at their moment, they're saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins. If they do not know you at this moment and they want to get to know you more, they will say, Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. If they do not know you at this moment, they will say, Lord, I believe you rose again. And to those believers, those believers who was looking for hope, Lord, place in their hearts. Let them quote the same statement. I believe that you rose from the dead. Because if they believe, Lord, that you rose from the dead, then they have to believe that you have all power. So God, I ask you to watch over their souls, watch over their minds. Lord, protect their hearts. Give them the strength. Let them know that they're more than conquerors. Let them focus more on you, Lord. I understand that life is all around their feet. I understand there is turmoil. I understand there are good days and there are bad days. But Lord, let them focus on you. Let them see themselves in the future, not as they are today. Let them know that greater is in them than is in the world. And God gives them the power. Lord, I ask you to grant peace to their homes. I ask you to meet every provision. For those, Lord, who are troubled as they go in and out, encapsulate them in a special uh, outside bubble, Lord, that you protect them from any hurt, harm, or any danger. Meet every need. I'm not just talking about the natural things, God. I know you provide for them, but their spiritual need, Lord. Meet their spiritual need. As they sleep on this evening, begin to speak to them in their minds. They are yours, Lord. Bring them back home. Bring them back to the family. Let them know that if they stand on you, they can conquer anything. Some of them had dreams, aspirations, believe they had plans, and it seems like the adversary pulled it right underneath their feet. Let them look down and see that you are yet holding them, and let them know it's greater for them in their future. It does not matter how big or how small, it matters that you have met their needs. And Father, you will give the, get the honor. Father, you will get the glory. And we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Amen and amen. Well, unity, we have to do our Luke 1 and 37. This is our COVID-19 scripture. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I always want to take time when we have time together because not only unity, but those in the community has sought it us out and has given, and we're so gracious for that. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. Thank you for how you have shared with us. Thank you uh, uh, for your sacrifice. And I wanted to tell you, thank you for that. I want you to know that we love you, we miss you, and we are thankful for everything. Again, thank you for all the prayers and the kind words. Before we leave each other, we often making sure that all is covered. So would you help me with your right hand say, what I say unto one, I say unto all, watch and pray. And you know what Pastor Roger says, wash your hands. I love you, Unity. I love you, the community. And I pray that God will continue to bless you.